Boy, what a great day. I'm feeling so good. You know what? I'm just gonna... Oh, what's that? <laughs> uh, Sophie, there's a knock at the door. Who is it? Should should we sh- should we see who it is? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Why, it's Dan and Jordan from Knowledge Fight. Hey, I had to How- come running when I heard that weird noise come out of your mouth <laughs> a second ago. <laughs> all, yeah. Check on you. All, all I want to say is... <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. you it, normally, it's my atonal grunting that opens the show. I, I don't know how you guys you have a you have a great song to lead you in. I don't know how you so consistently open a show without y- y- just grunting and and moaning. We do that o- under the theme song. Yeah, we, we yeah. do that. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's, that's the public. mics are turned off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. We're just, just like stretching going, ah! before you go run a, a marathon. You gotta just go. <laughs> just just putting out on we and yeah. doing like heavy heavy <laughs> in and out mm-hmm. breathing just pump yeah. it up hello god hi, hi i'm jordan it, you're jordan you're, yep. you're dan of the podcast knowledge fight uh, and also in dan's case of the legal effort to sue alex jones for <laughs> uh, repeatedly doing crimes <laughs> yeah I, I, I it's weird that, that may be a credit now Mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess I was a Legal consulting, expert. yeah, consulting expert on uh, uh, the de- the latest deposition that uh, Alex did uh, in the, the Texas cases. Yeah. People have, I, uh, people have pointed out multiple times that on like episode three or four of our show, we uh, I made the joke that uh, he would be involved somehow in the lawsuit, and we laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> 700 yeah. episodes later. Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember when I first started listening to your show, because I was doing the, the Behind the Bastards episodes on Alex Jones, I was like, God, I, I fucking hope someone involved in the, the case against him knows about these guys, because they are, <laughs> they are uncovering damning stuff every week, and it should probably be involved in the case. Yeah, um, it, it uh, finally, finally came about, and uh, yeah, good times. Yeah. Yeah, well, congratulations. Thank would you, you like to talk about something completely different from Alex Jones? I think that would be nice for that a That would change. be mm-hmm. a delight. So here's a spoiler. I, I lied. I lied to you. God it's it's not it! complete. It's not a it's it's a precursor to Alex Jones. Um, this is a story about how the wealthy in America uh, ate and uh, transformed Christianity. Ooh, uh, that's yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. That this is this is a, a story that is adjacent to the story of the John Birch Society. They're not going to come into it much here, but they are they are involved. Um, and it is a story that is uh, uh, adjacent to the rise of Alex Jones because obviously he's heavily influenced by the John Birch Society. This is ah. this is a precursor. We've talked on this show a bunch, and I know y'all are very well aware that like seventy two ish was the first time the religious right was like a political block in the country. Right? Mm-hmm. You've got fall well and these people kind of we- welding Billy Graham welding the right wing into a Republican coalition for the first time um, but that only was able to happen because of a process that got started in the 1930s and that's what we're going to talk about today Hooray. I mean I would have argued that the first was uh, the Crusades but you know it's very well, similar why, why are you going to politicize the Crusades <laughs> like, sometimes people look people were just vibing, vibing you know the just Crusades. some dudes on horseback a couple hey. armies of children getting sold into slavery not a cell phone in sight you know? it was non-partisan <laughs> yeah that's the important thing about it yeah, yeah. that's exactly right Every, we were able to put down all of our petty disagreements to <laughs> delude Jerusalem in a river of blood. Trickle down economics. Trickle up <laughs> economics. Yeah. And, All sides. And Saladin's Depoliticize <laughs> mass killings. I like that you asked uh, if we wanted to talk about something other than Alex. And I was like, yeah, maybe something light and breezy. Nope. No, absolutely not. Uh, I this thought is, maybe, maybe it was going to be an episode about the bagel boss. I don't Ooh, know. That been half nice. of this episode is, uh, is going to be me reading you letters that different millionaires sent each other talking about how to destroy democracy. Yeah, so That sounds about right. <laughs> that's that's good. Yeah. Huh. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate fan of interested in storytelling. I think it's probably the most powerful thing that people do. Um, you don't get no, no empire or social movement or civilization gets anywhere without like having a set of stories that the people who are inside that thing believe. And that really to a significant amount determines reality, right? There's a degree to which you can kind of, ignore even physical reality if the stories are strong enough as uh some of our 
um, uh, some of our anti-vax and anti uh, anti-vaccine friends can <laughs> can attest. You know, there, there's limits to that, but it's it's. It's it's a pretty powerful thing. If you can get people to believe a story, even a ridiculous one, um, you can you can get them to do almost anything. And capitalism itself thrives because of the stories people tell about it. Uh, the reality, of course, is that capitalism is a system that was cobbled together by a handful of rich people in the 1600s and 1700s. They created the first corporations, which allowed them to pool their money, share risk and profits for risky ventures overseas. Uh, and the first things they did was go to the Spice Islands and carry out a brutal genocide in order to gain a monopoly on nuts. I that feel was the like first you're thing being, capitalism okay. Ever did. I feel like you're being unfair to the East India Company. Okay, this was the, they, this was the Dutch East India Company. Yeah, yes. I mean, yeah. see, they, yeah, they was, were fine. It was a nonpartisan, <laughs> again, nonpartisan, for not absolutely. And hey, capitalism's not unique. Every system human beings have developed on a large scale is a river of blood. Like they all are. You know, <laughs> that's just the way. That's just the way people be. Um, da, 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 da. But if, if you if you tell the story. Of of capitalism accurately which is that it's you know another chapter in the history of human beings finding ways to be shitty to each other in large groups um that's not something people uh, like to hear right you're not going to get you're not going to get a whole bunch of people rah 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 over capitalism if you're just talking about how they murdered several ethnic groups for nutmeg you're certainly um, not going to get a lot of rah rah from the people who have a, a lot of capital yeah yeah ex- exactly <laughs> and those people like to find better stories to explain what capital is um, and to get people uh, to identify it enough that they'll threaten a race war uh, if you you try to amend the system at all, which is why groups like the Acton Institute, a right wing Christian think tank, write stuff like this. And I'm going to quote from an article titled How Christianity Created Capitalism. The people of the high Middle Ages were agog with wonder at great mechanical clocks, new forms of gears for windmills and watermills, improvements in wagons and carts, shoulder harnesses for beasts of burden, the ocean-going ship rudder, eyeglasses and magnifying glasses, iron smelting and ironwork, stone cutting, and new architectural principles. So many new types of machines were invented and put to use by 1300 that historian John Gimple wrote a book in 1976 called The Industrial Revolution of the Middle Ages. Without the growth of capitalism, however, such technical discoveries would have been idle novel. They would seldom have been put in the hands of ordinary human beings through swift and easy exchange. They would not have been studied and rapidly copied and improved by eager competitors. All this was made possible by freedom for enterprise, markets and competition. And that, in turn, was provided by the Catholic Church. Okay, I'm going to throw this out there. You got some uh, notes. <laughs> I'm going to throw this out there. It's a little late to respond There's, to this. No, this no, no, no. I think that it's oh. about time. Somebody has got to refute this, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think kind of the underlying words that he was saying was uh, slaves. Nothing would have been made without slaves, you know, like free labor. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and it's it's just it's so comprehensively silly because it's like, well, but during the Middle Ages, a huge amount of the most significant technological development and philosophical development and like mathematical developments were being made by the different caliphates that were in charge of the Muslim world, um, which were not living under a capitalist system. But um, they were under the Catholic Church. <laughs> yes, yes. Fa- famously, the Abbasid Caliphate, big fans of the Pope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it's it's it, it it's a pretty ludicrous way to look at 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 uh, to argue that like um, it's a pretty ludicrous description of history, I think. And we could dunk on this article all day, but it's the reality of the situation is just Christianity did not create capitalism. But there is a story which we're going to talk about today of how capitalism hijacked Christianity and the specific capitalists who masterminded this shit have names and like sent letters to each other. And we have those letters. A bunch of people have written about this. So now it's it's time for a fun story, guys. Um, hooray. Our tale starts in the decades before the Great Depression, when the massive trusts and fortunes accumulated by robber barons of the Gilded Age clashed increasingly with organized labor, right? You you start to get the 1880s, 1890s workers being like, well, what if what if we all formed together into a large uh, organization and tried to compete with the people telling us that our children should mine coal until they die? Um, Hey, hey, fellas, you want (laughs) to stop getting murdered and uh, work to death? Yeah? All right. Let's do it! Do we do we feel like there's an alternative to getting machine gunned by our boss when we ask for a race? <laughs> right. And then they got machine gunned by their boss. And then they, they absolutely no. did. Uh, and occasionally yep. the U.S. government. Um, 
so this this clash is happening and while it's you know part of why all of these clashes are happening is that like the late 1800s are just the recession after recession these like economic collapses um brought on by the fact that you know you know why they're brought on we've all lived through a bunch of economic collapses now yeah the equivalent of bitcoin of the day yeah Yeah. Yeah. i mean like it was bitcoin we've been on bitcoin for a while yeah so uh, the left is like swelling in this period into the early 1900s because of all of these economic collapses which as economic collapse does tend to make tends to make people go like well maybe capitalism's not so great you know maybe 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 the the system could be changed somewhat um a lot of those rabble rousers in the in this period uh these like labor leaders a lot of them were not just christian but christian members of the clergy uh and these folks saw the socialist ends they were fighting for as not just in line with but but demanded by their faith this was an era in which one in every 26 workers in the united states could expect to be maimed on the job like that is the early 1900s one out of every 26 workers is going to be seriously injured or killed on the job. Everybody everybody at Amazon is like, holy shit, one out of 26. What a a glorious era. (laughs) Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, this is such a glass half empty. (laughs) 25 out of 26. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Get maimed. Uh, Yeah, yeah, see? (laughs) Uh, Ministers like George D. Heron were outraged by the reduction of sacred human life to an economic unit. And they actually saw what capitalists were doing in this period as like a Offensive to their religion. Uh, he would Heron not like wrote, the present day. At not, all. <laughs> yeah. Um, he wrote an 1890 sermon called The Message of Jesus to Men of Wealth, in which he compared the struggle between labor and capital to the story of Cain and Abel. Heron argued that Cain's choice to murder his brother was, quote, the first bald, brutal assertion of self interest as the law of human life, an assertion always potential with murder. So he was like, literally, the owners of capital are the descendants of Cain. Like that. <laughs> Is, right, right, yeah. right, 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 right. Yeah. Although then in that form, Christianity did create capitalism. Is, I, you, I mean, you could are. Th- yeah, right. Yeah. There's an ar- I mean, there's an argument if that's I mean, what he's going to argue. I mean, but you're taking it out of Judaism's <laughs> block then, right? Cain and Abel's, they got more claim to that. <laughs> you're right. You're but right. then, of that's course, we get to that's a really uncomfortable conversation when we start saying that. Um, I'm a small minded fellow who didn't read the Torah close enough. And that's yeah. on me. That's on me. Look, the Abrahamic religions. Uh, I guess you could say that the devil created capitalism um, by convincing Cain to murder his brother that's the argument heron's kind of making here right right, Um, right, right. yeah he quote the trial in progress and he's talking about like the the trial of the labor movement is christ versus cain the decision to which the times are hastening us is shall christ reign in our american civilization like shall christ or cain reign in our american civilization sorry um so that that's how Heron frames it is like we the, the struggle between labor and capital is the same as the biblical struggle between like Cain and Abel. And are we going to let them murder us? And unfortunately, the answer was, yeah. Um, but, All right. Mm. <laughs> First thing that's unfamiliar to me about this guy, it seems as though he has read the Bible, which it does is seem like he might have read the no, Bible. That's that's an issue for me. I don't think Christianity is allowed to do that. Mm hmm. As to put, yeah. see the Middle Ages got a minister that one right. who read the Bible. Now that doesn't <laughs> seem right. So Heron stumped for Eugene V. Debs, uh, the hero of our episode on the Pullman strike when he ran for president heading the Socialist Party of America. And I want to quote now from a write up on this in the uh, website Sojourners. He was not the only minister to become a socialist either. One historian estimated that between 5 and 25% of all mainline Protestant clergy were socialist party members or voted for the party in the first three decades of the 20th century. Congregationalist minister Franklin Monroe Sprague wrote Socialism from Genesis to Revelation in 1892. John Spargo, a Methodist minister, became a socialist educator. Norman Thomas, a Presbyterian minister, ran for president of the United States as a socialist candidate from 1928 to 1948. Charles Vail, a universal Socialist minister was an important socialist writer. African Americans, both outside and inside of the Socialist Party, also demanded fairer economic systems that affected other facets of life, pushing white Christians and socialists to towards quote a new abolitionism. So there's some cool stuff happening in Christian thought in the first thirty years of the 20th century. Um, that doesn't is good for re- them. Yeah, I'm really I'm really proud of them. I, you <laughs> know, they had a good stretch. They did That's have a nice. good stretch. This is the they story of how that all got yeah. fucked up horribly. <laughs> yeah. um, 
But do, is that the prevailing attitude of, it's, of it's, Christian it's not, communities? That is a really good question. Yeah, it, it is not. As they said, this is somewhere between 5 and 25 percent of ministers in this period are members of the Socialist Party. Um, so right. probably it could means be they, 1 in 25. Yeah. It could, it could, well, it could be <laughs> it's 5 and 25. It's working for the uh, man. I don't know, something like that. Um, but there's also this, like, you, you have to assume if, you know, 15 or 20 percent of, of them are members, you've got another probably 20 or 30 percent who are at least sympathetic, but like not yeah. quite as far left. Um, I, I think mainstream Christianity, uh, because of how popular the labor movement is, is probably broadly sympathetic to a lot of these aims, if not as radical as the guys we just cited. Sure. Um, it is certainly not uh, pro-capitalist, and it is not seen by the capitalists as being pro-capitalists. Um, so Christian socialists often you know, combined the gospel of Jesus and what they had read in Marx. Uh, the interpretation that these guys had was that Jesus was a radical uh, who opposed capitalism. Um, less common was the idea that socialism could be a foundation for a universal humanistic religion, but there were some guys um, who said that, who were like, uh, uh, who, who kind of went from being uh, Christian ministers to being like, well, now I'm more of like just a socialist minister. And I feel like my Christianity is wrapped up in that. But this is like socialism is the, the religion that should be the religion of mankind. You get oh, that on like, that's I the fringe. Like, yeah, I don't like legislating from the pulpit. I'll tell you that right now. That's that's not what I'm in for here. Also, yeah. it sounds like exactly what <laughs> Alex is terrified of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The it, nightmare of nightmares. And, and for a lot it. of the capitalists in this period are fucking terrified of this because it's spreading really widely. Um, the cause of Christian socialists got a big shot in the arm in August of 1929 when the global economy collapsed and the roaring 20s yielded to the Great Depression. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected in 1932 on the promise of providing Americans with a new deal. This involved a bunch of banking reforms, a raft of new social programs, a jobs program, a whole bunch of stuff. Now, actual socialists uh, like Nicole Ashoff, who wrote The New Profits of Capital, saw the new deal or see the new deal as it was essentially a way for capitalists who were more reasonable and less monstrous than the, some of the other capitalists to keep the system limping along without a socialist revolution. Um, the Elizabeth so, Warren plan. Yeah. Socialists saw the New Deal as like, well, this is like a shameless compromise to keep capitalism going. And it's it's actually not a good thing. Um and then FDR was a little bit like, hey, you know, they could buy a lot of people to murder all of us. So maybe let's just chill out. And yeah, just I'm call not, this I, one. I, I, I'm we'll not going to take a, a stance on this. But yeah, I, it's, yeah, we're gonna, I it's, can't even walk, man. Yeah, I can't run away. <laughs> I'm not going to run away. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I do want to. I'm not going to necessarily endorse that. Like, you know, we should never have done the New Deal. We should have just like let the the, the revolution come because I don't know that that would have worked out. But that is an argument uh, of people will make. Um, and Nicole Ashoff writes in her book, quote, capital's ability to periodically present a new set of legitimating principles that facilitate the willing participation of society accounts for its remarkable longevity, despite periodic bouts of deep crisis following mass. Max Weber, one of the foremost social thinkers of the 20th century, uh, this belief system is called uh, this belief system, which justifies and legitimates capitalism and the primacy of profit making is the spirit of capitalism. Um, so that's like this, the, the term that these some of these thinkers use the spirit of capitalism for the the ways in which our justifications for it change over time. And the argument here is that kind of FDR was putting a new set of principles to legitimate capitalism. So capitalism is legitimate because we also have the social safety net and we'll take care of people and it's not this soulless system that we had in the decades prior we've changed it and so it can keep going right and the fact that capitalism is this syncretic um is seen by critics of capitalism as part of why it's so hard to fucking kill it's um, kind of like i'll change yeah <laughs> it'll yeah. be different baby i can It'll be different this change. time yeah, yeah. <laughs> take me back take yeah. me back come on yeah. so, so that's, that's what i hear that is what actual socialists are saying at the time but that's not what ca capitalists see so like the the capitalists who are opposed to fdr see him as the literal embodiment of linen coming to burn their mansions and molest their expensive pets right like that they don't they don't see this as like oh he's keeping the system that makes us all rich alive they see this as he's coming to tear it all down people are yeah, dying gonna, in the streets as much <laughs> yeah. actually i brought uh, a letter from this time period because i wanted to to join in mm -hmm. uh and this was written by a millionaire at uh, i think it was 1934 it just went ah! Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wait, turn over the page. Turn over the page. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 sorry. 
oh you got to stop this yeah uh, that was yeah, the last yeah, yeah. <laughs> th- th- that 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 is an adequate summary of what these yeah. people are saying at the time uh and a number of these dudes titans of industry guys who own companies like general motors um form an o- organization called the national association of manufacturers in 1895 i know uh, them <laughs> yeah oh you know that you know nam the camp the candy man was uh hanging <laughs> oh, out yes he was yeah he welch. sure he sure did he sure did yeah. welch the uh, one of the founders of the john birch society yeah now the the, the the nam had been right in the thick of those gilded age recessions uh we talked about earlier like that's why this comes out in 1895 there's all these collapses and the left is is rising you know you have these these huge armed strikes and like militant workers organizing and these people are like well if they're if they're organizing with guns to f- stop people from bringing scabs in, couldn't they organize with guns to take our our stuff <laughs> you know you know that we- is that is one of the things about the organized left so mm. somewhat is like that that obsession with policing each other of being like no this is how we protest we only do it this way and then if you go back in history and it's like they broke windows and threw grenades into places mm-hmm. they lit everything on fire yeah, there was like, not a lot of discussion about like well now you're making it violent there was this discussion yeah, of like yeah, how yeah, do we yeah. build the best grenades to throw at our right, bosses right, right. <laughs> exactly. they, had, uh, they had nitpicking arguments about how many nails should go through the back yeah <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, it, it was a different time, and so these 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 businessmen get very scared of this different time, and they create the NAM as a way to kind of like organize um, and develop a strategy uh, to protect themselves. Um, so you know, Roosevelt comes to power, and initially they're kind of they have a bunch of different things that they're that they're scared about. They're also really worried about like domestic industry getting f- flooded by foreign imports and stuff. But when Roosevelt comes to power, and they actually see this big socialist legislation get past um they start flipping out and thinking like uh it, you know also the thing that's happening in this period is the ussr has just formed so they're they're both seeing okay we had these armed workers in the streets they're getting more organized they're in ch- the halls of power in washington and they're gonna make they're gonna do what the ussr did and soon we'll all be you know executed and our stuff will be taken from us um so in am pivots to opposing the New Deal. Um, Their primary contention was that FDR sought to provide people with a sense of security and a safety net, and this was a bad idea. This is literally what they're writing at the time. Giving people a safety net is a bad idea, because if people aren't scared of dying in the street, they won't work as hard, and the free market system will fail. (laughs) I mean, this is absolutely true. I have seen a lot of trapeze acts, and they work harder when there is not a net. Yeah, they do. Uh, There's a lot of of lazy trapeze artists. Walmart yeah. will have fewer employees if no one is going to starve to death if they don't work there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you might not be able to run Walmart the current way that it's run. <laughs> People don't uh, dance quite as fast as they do when you're shooting at their feet. Okay, here's my plan. All right, we give everybody a social safety net, but you have to go through a gauntlet of like spiked things that are moving and like spinning. And then uh, you have to yeah. climb the aggro crag. Totally. You have mm-hmm. to climb the aggro crag. That's the way to get to work every day. I I actually think that would be dope. What, what if I, I what know, if the right? Build Back Better plant were like I'm going to say a <laughs> trillion dollars for more agro crags? Yeah. <laughs> what if it was just a better salary for Mike O'Malley? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it goes a hundred percent to Mike O'Malley. <laughs> <laughs> Some of it's got to go to Mo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. I'm Come sorry. On. That's that's what's Mo. going to split the left, Dan. <laughs> yeah. Is is yes, how much money true. goes to Mo? <laughs> yeah. You team Mo or you team Malley? What this, are you going to choose? Go, it's going to end like uh, <laughs> fucking. Um, uh, 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 Madrid in 1938 <laughs> with people shooting each other in the street banners with Moe's face machine <laughs> guns yeah. his insistence on paying Mo equally <laughs> since wokeism run amok <laughs> oh, oh yeah. god fantastic you know what else is wokeism run amok Dan and Jordan mm. what's that the products and services that support this podcast oh shit unless it's the Washington State Highway Patrol Hmm? Yeah, they they advertising on your show now. <laughs> they do they do from time to time. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you're, um, you're doing ads for cops. I know we're, we're we're not doing them. They just come on the the fucking feed. We're 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 working on it. But we yeah. we did an episode on the Washington State Highway Patrol recently, which they advertised on. It was like what happened with Bloomberg. <laughs> That's, that's that's meta as hell. Yeah, I don't think. I mean, they're wasting their money. I don't think anyone who listens to any of these shows is going to become a Washington State Highway Patrol officer. Um, probably not 
probably not. It's like it's like <laughs> I'll see like Epoch Times ads on yeah. like left wing videos I see on on YouTube. It's very weird. Yeah, it's 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 funny. Um, but you know, here's uh, fucking <laughs> probably. <laughs> I do that because Sophie has to bleep it. Oh, we're back. <laughs> Did you guys know that Blue Apron is the only food box company <laughs> that runs an island off the coast of Indonesia where you can hunt children for sport? Did they buy Little St. James? They did. They did. They bought Little yeah, St. James, too. But they haven't, they, they haven't got that one going yet. That's down in the sure. Bahamas. The it's only kind of, the only person I want to hunt is John Leguizamo, and that's because The Pest was my favorite movie in the 90s. So mm. that's just how it's got to go for me. I mean, I don't think any court would convict you, but that's a separate discussion. <laughs> so we're, 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 we're talking we're, we're talking uh, uh, this period where you've got, you know, the NAM who is terrified that uh, who, who starts advancing the idea that if you build a safety net, the, the free market system will collapse because people won't be scared enough of dying in the street, which is an argument you hear today. I actually just this week, Representative John Rose, a Republican from Tennessee, used this argument to explain why health care was not a right, why we shouldn't have universal health care. Uh, quote, if you really want to be free it can't be a right we have to have an incentive for people to struggle to support themselves like this is th this is when that line is invented right that was not mm -hmm. always a justification that like if we try to do a safety net people won't work hard um that that's in th they're coming up with this stuff in this period you know it's the it's cool it's good what stuff. a great scam it is what a, great a really scam. great scam to just look people dead in the eye and say Live or die, buddy. You should go to work today. Yeah. <laughs> if you amazing. aren't starving, then this whole Just system amazing. falls apart. It's a little insulting, too, in terms of, like, <laughs> saying that people who do things don't have any reason to do it other than, like, pure survival. You yeah, know, I like, think a lot of jobs people would do it if if money didn't exist in the same form. I think most of the people who were doctors would be doctors if, you know, sure. we lived under a different system. I think all of the people who are artists would still be artists, except for maybe yeah. Pitbull. Does, um, I, I mean, I had to cut Dan's Achilles tendons to make sure that he stayed here. But other that's than why that, I'm always in this chair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, like, just the, basically what you have to do with chickens to keep them in the <laughs> yeah, roost. Yeah, keep absolutely. them laying those yeah, eggs, yeah, baby. Uh, yeah, 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 Dan. Gotta come on. Clip Dan's wings so he doesn't fly out right. and start right another podcast. Till I die. Can't have me going to, to Austin again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the um the thing too that it seems weird is like this seems to imply that uh, the people in the National Association of Manufacturers are only doing that uh to uh, they wouldn't be doing this stuff if they didn't fear for their lives no i mean you know, yeah like, you, you are you are right that that is kind of they're projecting a bit that like yeah literally everything you do is because you're afraid of winding up like the people you are fighting to keep struggling um mm -hmm. So the resistance of these manufacturers to the rising tide of socialism was at first disorganized and somewhat incoherent. You know, like I said, this the argument line they advanced is still around today, but that's not something you're going to immediately get a lot of people on board with. In order for that idea to become universal on the right, um, you have to lay some groundwork. Um, so they, they decide to do that in a couple of different ways. They're trying a, sort of a shotgun approach. They have like a propaganda campaign dedicated to fighting anti-business sentiment, but People don't like big businesses ever, really. Like even even today, people on the right, nobody likes big corporations. So that's not an easy thing to do. They do. No, the most important thing to do on the right is demonize giant corporations while at the same time being like, but you need to make sure they have all of your money. Yeah. I mean, it, like, make sure of that. Yeah. And, and that's that's kind of why like they th that that doesn't prove to be a very productive line for them either. Um, with, when they first get their real idea of like what's actually going to work to advance these ideas in American society is when the Red Scare hits in the late 1930s um, and Texas Democratic Congressman Martin Dees founds the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Um, the media starts going nuts with like there's, you know, Reds coming here trying to do a USSR in the United States, all these dangerous anarchists and communists and whatnot. Um, we need to invade Iraq. And that the, these these businessmen businessmen realize that like, well, no, the thing to do, it's not to fight anti-business sentiment. Um, that's not going to be productive and it's not going to be to tell people they need to struggle. It's it's you have to cloak this in fighting communism because people are scared of what they're hearing in the USSR. And that's going to work a hell of a lot better than anything else. Um 
So Dees publishes a book in 1940 called The Trojan Horse, in which he claims communism is a religion that has replaced religious faith with materialism. Dees warns that communists were waging a psychological invasion to conquer the American way of life. And some of the brighter guys at the NAM see this and fi- as the opportunity that it is. Dees isn't saying anything about free enterprise here, but he's tying socialism in as opposed to religion, which obviously in the USSR, at least it was, you know, they, they, they like they outlaw it. You know, you have all yeah, these commies. Yeah, yeah there should have been like the far right sending up fireworks the moment he put that to paper of just yeah. like, this is the birth of a new God. Yeah, they, they get out there. It's like the telegram scene at the end totally. of uh, Independence Day. They're like, this is how to, this is how to do it. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is essentially a compound noun. At yeah. this point, yeah. like godless communism. Totally. Yeah. You know, like- and and it, what some of these guys at the NAM um, who are not dumb men recognize that what needs to be done, D's got the germ of a good idea, but it's not enough to just say the communists are going to replace religion. You also have to tie capitalism to religion. You have to make Christianity intimately a part of capitalism. And that that's how you fucking do this shit, right? That's the groundwork you need to get people to believe all the shit you need them to believe if you want to keep all of the money in your hands, you know? Hey, if you want people to believe something fake, go to the people who already believe fake shit. I, I do apologize to our, our our number one listener, the Pope. Uh, Jordan, Jordan does not speak for everyone here. Um, big big fan uh, of the Pope. Um, not not the new one, the one who was a Nazi. Um, right, right, right. Don't right, like course. that he was a Nazi or that he covered up a lot of sexual harassment, but he's actually he's incredible at ping pong, and um, you know, <laughs> I, I I appreciate uh, I appreciate that. Sophie's just letting this happen. Wow. <laughs> Un- unbelievable i can't believe that sophie I- i've just been sitting here i i probably would have jumped in but i was trying to come up with a d's nuts joke. i've been mm-hmm. doing it, the I, same yeah, thing yeah. It, it's impossible to not think about that yeah yeah i was thinking like can you believe how influential these <laughs> D's yeah. nuts, not which just, which D's? Yeah, it's, it's, now, D's nuts. Yeah. Oh, okay. When they come up with this idea that like, okay, we need to we need to tar the left as anti-religion, um, and we need to t- we need to make people associate capitalism and Christianity together. When this idea is, is like born, it's a pretty long, like it's not an easy thing to do, right? For one thing, FDR is in office and he is famous for being the first president to basically give religious sermons as speeches. Um, A lot of his speeches, he's quoting from the Bible constantly. The National Bible Press actually publishes a chart where people can like find on a regular basis and it'll like give his speeches and it'll list the Bible quotes that he's like re- paraphrasing or talking about or like like a discussing. bingo card. Yeah. Yeah. For because <laughs> because he's basically like a preacher. Like that's how FDR talks to the nation. Um and FDR, FDR is really for for all of the you know arguments that are very valid you know about him essentially stopping a socialist revolution by introducing reform. He also really ties um, Christianity to anti capitalism in his speeches. In one, FDR states, "quote The money changers have fled their high seats in the temple of our civilization." When he's talking about uh, the New Deal, so he's he's the, the, the NAM's plan to like reverse this is they they are they are dealing with like this is not an easy thing right today it's obviously the left is godless and the right is is christian and capitalist that is um they have a long road to get there at this point they got to basically cr- climb the aggro crag yeah they got to climb an aggro <laughs> crag that's exactly yeah, yeah. right that's the metaphor i would use you have to hit each button along uh, the way you have to hit the combined capitalism with jesus button you yeah. have to hit the yeah yeah, yeah you a, do lot, that. a lot what needs <laughs> doing a lot um, of fog. and they get delayed by a little thing you guys might have heard of. You haven't really covered it in your show, so I'm not sure if you're aware of it. Um, World War II, um, which... What? Yeah, yeah. There, there was, was a, a second, second one. It was what? not as interesting. It was <laughs> not as interesting. This is how I find out about this? This is... Uh, I gotta go. It was It was Jay! less less aliens and more Temple of Doom, you know? Um, mm. Yeah. Unfortunate. Uh, you hate to see, you know, a sequel that just doesn't live up to the original, but... Sophomore slump? Yeah, uh, so, World exactly. Wars. World War Three, <laughs> yeah. though. That's gonna be... 
that's going to be Jedi. our that's going to be our <laughs> Alien Three. You know, finally, <laughs> finally, the good what, one. You don't you don't like the Last Crusade? I like the Last Crusade. The la- yeah, actually, the, the Last Crusade is maybe my favorite good. of them. Yeah, <laughs> it's so Sean great. Connery and Harrison Ford. What more oh, do you want? Man, oh. Sean Connery the, the and Harrison Ford fighting he's got Nazis. The stamp. He's got the stamp in the library, and at yeah. the same time, he hits this. And that's just great comedy. It, that's yeah. just great comedy, man. It, it is. It's good. Good movie. <laughs> so let's hope our World War Three is less Alien Three and more. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Fingers crossed, everybody. Absolutely. Fingers crossed. Um, our World War Three that may have started by the time this episode drops. <laughs> well, to be fair, that's World War Four, according to some people, because of the, the Cold War. The Cold War. <laughs> some sure. of the people who are maybe involved in the story you're telling might yeah. do it that way. My my argument is, if if the Germans don't start it, it's not a world war. You know. Mm. If it's not from Champagne in France, it's yeah. not really Champagne. Yeah. It's, not really it's champagne. just a sparkling global <laughs> conflict. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can I just say all of your laughs about the next world war? Pretty scary. Yeah, I mean, what yeah, else are you going to do? Because they're scary laughs. Robert, yeah. We're all you terrified. You like, realize world we're terrified. War III. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... Robert's so, not allowed to predict you know, things, World guys. War II kicks off, and this is bad <laughs> for the NAM, both because a lot of the guys involved in the NAM were part of the America First movement and did not want to go to war because they were big fans of Nazi Germany. But it's also a problem I thought it because, was because they had spent too much time in NAM. Boom! Give me 50 no. point. NAM, NAM, I got NAM. You. Yeah, we we, we not, got it. No. We're just... All right. Everybody's got no, the same no look, one. which is no one. quiet disapproval. No no, 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 I want more. I can't help you out when you yell boom and then want a high five. I just can't help you. So during the war years, NAM's propaganda, they can't really like execute this plan that they've started to cobble together because the U.S. is allied with the USSR. So fear mongering against the Reds does not work as well when you are shipping them as many tanks as you can possibly put together. You know, when you are handing as many guns as you have to the Soviets because they're the only thing standing between the world and and a tide of Nazis, it's hard to get people scared about the commies, you know? Mm. Yeah, a little <laughs> um, bit tough. Yeah, so they are they are kind of planning and thinking during this period, though. And one of the things that some of these people re- start to realize is that if they're really going to push this agenda through, if they're going to make Christianity and capitalism be the same thing in the minds of millions of Americans, it's not going to a bunch of CEOs aren't going to make that happen. They need an inside man. They need a popular, charismatic preacher who knows how to talk to other ministers and to congregations. They need an active partner who is a religious leader. And they find this partner in James W. Fifield Jr. Now, I want to quote from a write up in Politico by Kevin Cruz, who's done a lot of writing on this subject. Quote, In December of 1940, more than 5,000 industrialists from across the nation made their yearly pilgrimage to the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City, convening for the annual meeting of the National Association of Manufacturers. The program promised an impressive slate of speakers, titans at General Motors, General Electric, Standard Oil, Mutual Life, and Sears Roebuck, popular lecturers such as etiquette expert Emily Post and renowned philosopher historian Will Durant, even FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Tucked away near the end of the program was a name few knew initially. Reverend James W. Fifield Jr. Handsome, tall, and somewhat gangly, the 41-year-old Congregationalist minister bore more than a passing resemblance to Jimmy Stewart. Addressing the crowd of business leaders, Fifield delivered a passionate defense of the American system of free enterprise and a withering assault on its perceived enemies in Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration. Decrying the New Deal's encroachment upon our American freedoms, the minister listed a litany of sins committed by the Democratic government, ranging from its devaluation of currency to its disrespect for the Supreme Court, single out the regulatory state for condemnation, he denounced the multitude of federal agencies attached to the executive branch and warned ominously of the menace of autocracy approaching through bureaucracy. So, All right. Yeah. I have to assume Emily Post had some notes on that, that speech. <laughs> I think she was on board. <laughs> might not have been great etiquette, though. I think we might not want to look too much into what Emily Post believed. <laughs> <laughs> It's wild that though you could have like uh, someone who is an etiquette expert whose name is still recognizable. You know, it like is. It is. It, it's what if impressive. If someone was going around now being an etiquette <laughs> expert, yeah, is that what an influencer is ultimately? Mm. Yeah. No. No. Well, okay. Emily Post was. You know what? Like, Emily I shot Post my shot. was an influencer. I shot my shot and I missed, and that's she, fine. That's fine. She was an early influencer. I mean, she was kind of like Marie Kondo, um, but of being polite in dinner parties. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Try not saying go fuck yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Fifield's primary argument to this this huge room full of the richest people in the world was that capital could only save itself from the min- menaces of unionism and social democracy by tying itself in religion in opposition to Soviet socialism, which was godless. He was adamant that the clergy would be big business's strongest ally in this quest, and his speech was met with thunderous applause. So they this guy is saying a, exactly what these dudes have been thinking um and he's also seems to be proposing a way forward in this plan fifield had been beating this particular drum for a while he'd gotten his start in michigan uh, his big brother was a really popular preacher who gained prominence uh in that area for taking over a struggling church and turning it profitable and fifield did the same thing he himself and it was so successful that he got a gig at the first congregational church in los angeles in 1935 and i want to quote now from a pe- paper by eckert toy from the university of washington Washington on Fifield's background. When Fifield became minister of the church, he realized it had incurred a substantial debt of $750,000, which is like $13 million today. To address the church's debt, he launched a campaign to raise the profile of the church, both locally and nationally, and he instituted an adult education series called College of Life, which employed 14 professors from universities throughout California. He began broadcasting five radio programs and initiated a speaker series club. His public relations talent soon paid off, and the church was out of debt by 1942. So this is the guy who creates the first mega church like and he does this in a very interesting way um because that's his 13... first sermon was called sinners in the hand of a wealthy god that's that yeah basically <laughs> yes that's almost exactly yes. what he does because yeah, he's like yeah. he he's in la this is a church in an affluent part of the city that's like the modern equivalent of 13 million dollars in debt um <laughs> and how are you going to make 13 million dollars heading a church Become L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, well, kind Wait, what? of. Yeah. Yeah. Kind, you, basically. You, you Become create, an influencer. Yeah, you exactly. You create a sort of cult, but instead of you being the cult leader, you create a cult where you convince all of these rich people that they are godly by virtue of being rich, and then they'll give you enough money that you can get your church out of debt, right? Is, um, do you think Do you think he's the guy, I don't know if you've heard this, but for, for I, I'm more than passingly familiar with Christianity. But when I grew up, the explanation of the like, you can't get a, uh, it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than a Mm -hmm. camel through than an eye of the needle. Somebody had this pitch of like, the eye of the needle was actually like this really narrow bridge. This gate that they've now built. Totally. I actually, I just looked into this recently and uh, that's nonsense. No, of course it's nonsense. But I'm, I'm wondering if this is the dude who fucking pulled that shit off. You know what I'm saying? I yeah. don't think so. I don't think it goes back that far. Okay. But yeah, the, that's, that, that exists in multiple that, of the synoptic gospels and the word that's used is different. So it wouldn't be like referring to a specific gate. It would right. have to be no, like, no, no, the no. concept. So it, that's yeah. nonsense. It was very clear. But I think, yeah. I think that that came about after this period that we're right. talking about. Okay, yes, gotcha. that, that, I think that specifically does, but the general thing of figuring out, a, like saying that, no, 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 despite what, what everyone says about Jesus, he actually thinks if you're a good person, you get rich. <laughs> what um, everyone says. Jesus, what the, the man Bible who was says. violent once in his life, and it was against <laughs> bankers. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. But there if was you that read, time he said he, he liked swords. There right? was was that he did like uh, sell your stuff and get a sword (laughs) if you read the good gospels at one point in time he murders a kid just for getting in his way so oh, you're, you're, getting, you're getting Gnostic yeah. now. That's yeah, the, yeah. that's the shit. He killed dragons. <laughs> Jesus was Child a badass, gospel. ultimate mm-hmm. superhero. Just murdering kids left and right. Um, that's he the brought Jesus. Him back. Yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> he brought him so back. So he's just fucking with them. <laughs> yes, he was more fucking with the parents. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was a better time. <laughs> that is that is the kind of Christianity I could get on board with. <laughs> Um, so Fifield gets his church out of debt by appealing to the wealthiest people in Los Angeles, um, and, and finding ways to show them that like Christian doctrine actually says you don't need to give money to the poor. Uh, sources will often describe him as politically conservative, but doctrinally liberal. And what that means is that like he was right. He was very conservative with his politics, but he was liberal in his interpretation of the Bible because it let him justify his politics. <laughs> it was loose with his, yeah. trans- like his uh, interpretation. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, he's a fun guy. Um, so he, he tweaked the Bible a lot. Cruz notes that he, quote, dismissed the many passages in the New Testament about wealth and poverty and instead assured the elite that their worldly success was a sign of God's blessings. This is a huge hit. He, he I mean, again, he makes 13 million dollars in the space of a few years, like four years to get his church out of debt. He is That's very like, good at this. If you've re- if you've ever read Douglas Adams is, uh, I think, the fifth book in the. Uh, yes. <laughs> there was a there's a character where uh, Ford Prefect goes to this planet and there is a sex worker who explains that her job is telling rich people that it's okay to be rich. Mm-hmm. And that is exactly what that guy's job is. Yeah. Isn't that, it? that is literally yeah. the whole thing he's doing. The whole thing. It's just, it's okay for you to be rich and fuck with everybody. You're yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. You're you, don't good. Need to, right. you don't need to give your money up in taxes, You're but I'll give some, it to and me. I'll keep telling Come you, on. I'll find, I'll, I'll cut the Bible apart to make you yeah. feel like a decent <laughs> yeah. person. Isn't um, it actually like... charity to get me out of this debt? Yeah. <laughs> It's it, like diametrically opposed to the slave Bible. It is his Bible is the rich person Bible, and then they cut out the different shit for the other. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he he um he this is wildly successful. Again, he makes seven hundred fifty grand in like four years, you know, in donations, which is a fuckload of money. So he decides I got to take this shit on the road. You know, like I could uh, this works this well in L.A. I could make this work everywhere. He founds an organization <laughs> called Comedian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's going to go on tour. So yes, exactly. He founds an organization called Spiritual Mobilization. Their mission was to, quote, arouse the ministers of all denominations in America to check the trends towards pagan statism, which would destroy our basic freedom and spiritual ideals. Pagan statism is the term you will hear a lot. It is the first cultural Marxism. Um, It's directly in that line of lineage to like pagan statism. Um, or to, to, to where we are now, like pagan statism is kind of like the first boogie man term they come up with. Um, I can see why they upgraded to, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause what, that one one's thing, not so great. Throw pagan in front of anything and it sounds cool as hell, you know? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. That's true. I, when I hear pagan statism, I'm thinking of like Romans getting like drunk and, and, and running around the city, carrying a bull on their shoulders and shit. That's the type like, of that state sounds I dope. Yeah. 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 Hell yeah. <laughs> Um, so the specific way Fifield justified Christian capitalism was to argue that God had imbued people with certain rights and responsibilities. We had the right to private pro- property and the freedom of choice, including the choice to be poor. So if the government were to take private property from the rich and give it to the poor, that is a violation of God's law. The church then has a duty to defend against this. So you're not being political by being a capitalist church. You're actually following God's law. By t- being a capitalist church, so not only did Christianity invent capitalism, they also created sovereign citizens. Yeah, <laughs> we got it all. Yeah. <laughs> so the ideals Fifield was exploring eventually formed into an ideology called Christian libertarianism, which is most accurately summed up as letting rich people do whatever they want and saying that's what God wants. Um, you know, that's the that's the idea. I've what, seen a bit of that. Yeah, you you, you you kind of spend every waking day of your life uh, <laughs> in wading through the waters of Christian libertarianism. Hey, um, if Elon Musk weren't great, God wouldn't have given him billions of dollars. That's right? right. That makes sense. That's what everyone says about Elon Musk. Mm-hmm. One of Fifield's major supporters was Herbert Hoover, the president who had gloriously led the United States into the jaws of the Great Depression and then spent the rest of his life angry that people had voted for FDR when they'd had a chance to get him out of office in 1932. FDR What's wrong won- with living in a tent? What's wrong with living in a tent? <laughs> that Come is on, Hoover. Man. Hoover's like, why don't you like your tents? Come on, it's a good tent. Mm-hmm. Uh, FDR won that election, 472 electoral votes to 59. So Hoover, Ho- Herbert Hoover is like licking his wounds. You know, he feels mm. pr- pretty ornery about this. What were those 59? Yeah. Do we not look at? <laughs> you, you can look. You can look it up. There were, were a couple states? of states. You know, the bad ones. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> Five bucks says Tennessee is on there. Yeah. Per- I'll just maybe. throw that out. It was like there was a it was a union hotbed at the time though. I don't know. Texas oh, that's probably true. was though. That's yeah. true. Texas, yeah, 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 yeah. Texas probably. I don't know. Maybe we're getting it wrong and someone's gonna get like uh, up at us on Reddit. Uh I have no idea who those who those states were. <laughs> Me neither. Um 
Hoover wanted to use Fifield. So they start up like a conversation and he, and he sees Fifield as like a representative of Protestant Christianity that he can use to snipe at FDR. Uh, in eight, 1938, he writes to Fifield, if it would be possible for the church to make a non-biased investigation into the morals of this government, they would find everywhere the old negation of Christianity that the end justifies the means. So he's like, I want you to look into you know this government as an anti-Christian government because FDR gave people social security. <laughs> um, Fifield follows her, Hoover's advice. Uh, later that year, he writes and sends out a tract to more than 70,000 clergymen in the United States. Uh, and in the tract, he says it, it, basically what Hoover had said, and he begs his fellow ministers to follow him in opposing FDR's socialist policies. Um, Fifield wrote, quote, we ministers have special opportunities and special responsibilities in these critical days. America's movement towards dictatorship has already eliminated checks and balances and its concentration of powers in our chief executive which you know jesus said the meek shall inherit the earth but after the current rich people are already dead and their money is given away yeah. well actually we'll see a thousand or maybe you know two thousand three thousand years or so the meek will totally inherit the earth it's coming meek guys don't I worry i promise Meek, you stay meek though. Otherwise, yeah. you're not going to inherit the earth. That True. makes perfect That's sense to me. Point. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, I, I, you do have to get be a little fair here when people are talking about you know FDR being a dictator. Obviously, these folks are loony. But also, if you are ever going to accuse a president of trying to be a dictator, FDR is a pretty good one because like he he oh, does totally. have a lot of power that he has centralized in himself. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on the other hand, he had a lot of folk to fight against who were yeah. <laughs> right. There was a him. lot going on, you know, <laughs> yeah. there was a lot going on in that period. It's he definitely was the president at one of the toughest times to be president. Mm. Um, did a lot right. Did a lot wrong. Uh, yeah. So Hoover, after Fifield sends this letter out to 70,000 clergy, Hoover notes, like sends a letter back, like thanking him and, and telling him how much he appreciates it. Um, but all of this stuff, it's clear, like sending out letters to ministers about this shit isn't enough to catch on in any in any meaningful way like Fifield may have sent this letter out but that doesn't mean people are going to start preaching to their congregations that the FDR administration is evil for one thing he's the most popular president there's ever been you know like there is that people he got elected an awful lot <laughs> <laughs> we like eating yeah this guy's great <laughs> very popular and so a lot of these yeah. ministers say to Fifield basically like I'm not going to do this. Like why everyone, he, he, <laughs> the, the only reason my, 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 my uh, congregation haven't starved to death is this guy. What are you talking about? Um, yeah. And of course there's also the fact that, you know, churches are tax exempt, but there's ways they can lose that by lobbying directly politically. Um, so there's a lot of, <laughs> there, there were, there, there were, fucking there were, were. there um, were, he's got a lot to overcome and he writes this letter. Hoover likes it, but it doesn't do anything. So Fifield on his own, you know, he's, he's accomplished a lot in his little church. He can make rich people feel good. He's not going to change Christianity all on his own, but the NAM has the resources that might allow him to do this and kind of on their own. They're not going to be able to make any of this make inroads, but together they can be an Oreo of fucking up democracy forever. Um, like a Voltron of shit. <laughs> like a shit Voltron. Yeah. So. In 1946, with the Cold War in its early days and World War II behind us, NAM's PR department commissions a poll from the Opinion Research Corporation to determine which groups did the most to shape public opinion in the United States. Ministers topped the list, and I'm going to quote now from a doctoral thesis by Carmen Celestini of the University of Waterloo. Quote, NAM interpreted this finding as being potentially harmful to the American people because, according to NAM, ministers tended to be on the very left, both socially and fiscally. NAM AM members decided to take on the responsibility to halt a broader American swing to the left that was led by the clergy and influenced by the social gospel of the early 20th century. Robert Wilson, the board chairman of the Standard Oil Company at the time, wrote, Unless the practical-minded men of business take the time and trouble to point out the facts of history and the serious flaws in these widely touted old world systems that have failed so miserably in practice, church leaders are likely to be swung to the left. They will hear only one side of the questions from left-wingers who do take the time to talk with them and on them uh, so oh my god you, you lost that impression uh, i know i that, felt that like he was here i character. felt like he's alive i felt like <laughs> it was i tried to bring him back no, i tried to no, bring no, bobby no. wilson back like look do you know who my favorite person on snl was, was jimmy fallon that mm -hmm. was my favorite one because mm -hmm. he never did a good job okay 
<laughs> I, I do. I did like, you know, the, the beautiful thing about Jimmy Fallon is that it's, it's proof that you don't need to be funny or talented or good at talking or good at anything or even legally a human being to be a, a popular television host. It's got to be nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, the uh, the NAM launches a bunch of PR campaigns kind of based on Wilson's idea of trying to explain the facts of history, you know, to to Americans to counter this leftward swing of the clergy. Um, and this is like a, a full court press. By 1949, there's print, radio, TV ads, billboards, all aimed at mobilizing Americans against socialism and for Christianity. Celestini continues, quote, an initiative was led by Charles E. Wilson, General Electric's president, under the Religion in America, an American Life RIAL committee, which was a religious public relations campaign sponsored by corporations, religious leaders, and the American government. As historian John P. Herzog described in this successful 10-year campaign, used celebrity endorsements to convince Americans that religious participation was a normative act. So it, 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 they're kind of try, they're trying to like make the case in this that like socialism is anti-religion and religion isn't Christianity is inherently American. They're not yet saying capitalism is inherently Christian, but they are. This whole effort is sponsored by like general electric and shit. Right. So you can see this stuff starting to get tied together. Um, in 1930, you got to lay, lay the groundwork a little. You got to lay you know, that groundwork. Gotta... That's what they're trying to do here. And in 1934, NAM spent thirty six thousand dollars on PR. In 1937, it was eight hundred thousand dollars, and it goes up from there. So they are they are like massively increasing their PR budgets to put this propaganda out there. One technique they pioneered. They're the first people to do this. Is they had a speakers bureau that would get speakers into public schools to talk to kids about Christianity and against socialism. They also were the first to build a press service that would provide editorial articles for newspapers to publish um just like well here's alec a, yeah <laughs> yeah 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 they're yeah. they're they're the first people doing that and they're th- this originally eventually reaches more than 7500 newspapers in the united states that they they put <laughs> editorials in this is a massive propaganda effort <laughs> like i i understand that this is uh obvious and fundamentally a little naive but like, that's not fair. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's not. <laughs> like, that's cute. It seems like it seems like it should be easier to convince people like of of my positions on things just by telling them that because it seems so obvious that it's just like that's not fair. Mm. Like, even yeah. if you disagree with my ultimate ends, just like, let's make that fair. Just one thing. Let's try and make one thing fair. So it sounds no. like you don't like freedom. I yeah. hate it. It sounds like you yeah. don't like the people's ability the, to the, speak. The freedom no. of a couple of no. dudes to place 7,500 articles in there newspapers. There is only freedom in oppression, <laughs> but, Dan. But what is that other than speech? Mm-hmm. It sounds like you don't like the First Amendment. Uh, you yeah. know what? I probably would have been a bad Supreme Court I think we've. I think we found the pinko, Dan. <laughs> Let's <laughs> Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Get Hoover I'm on God the board. Red Road. diaper doper baby over here. <laughs> That's it, born. You know who else will purge the Reds from our mist? Who's that? The products, uh, the and, services products and services. Products and services. Oh, 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 I got well, that. Well, actually, <laughs> exclusively purges children from their parents' homes and puts them on their island off the coast of Indonesia where you can hunt them for sport. Yeah. And coming soon to Little St. James. Yeah, coming soon to Little St. James. It's going to be the Euro Disney of hunting children for sport. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ads. Ah, we're back. So. As we've talked about, this propaganda campaign that the NAM carries out has reaches a shitload of people, but it also doesn't do the trick. It is not as successful as they want it to be because the, it's really crude and obvious propaganda. And I'm going to quote from Kevin Cruz again here. Ultimately, though, industry self-promotion was seen as precisely that. Jim Farley, chairman of the Democratic Party, joked that another group involved in this public relations campaign, the American Liberty League, really should have been called the American Cellophane League. First, it's a DuPont product, Farley quipped. And second, you can see right through it. Even President Franklin Delano Roosevelt took his shots. It has been said that there are two great commandments. One is to love God and the other is to love your neighbor, he noted soon after the Liberty League's creation. The two particular tenets of this new organization say you should love God and then forget your neighbor. Off the record, he joked that the name of the God they worshipped seemed to be property. 
which it is yes, ass. absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, you could have you could have put the nail on the head with a Moloch, but you yeah. know, you still you still crushed it. I, I'm still proud of him. So this effort that the NAM is like, and the, the the part of the NAM that kind of like Wilson is 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 leading, um, they're trying to support public religion make the act of religion anti-socialist um, and tie that into capitalism just by the fact that it's sponsored by corporations, right? It's kind of a subtle thing compared to what Fifield is doing. Reverend Fifield wants to make Christianity capitalist and celebrate wealth as the uh, evidence that God loves you. Um, and that is like, you know, there's that chunk of the NAM that's kind of going about it a different way, but there's increasingly in the 40s a group of guys in the NAM who start to see what Fifield's doing and are like, no, 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 this is the way. This is what's going to fucking work. And the two men who are leading that charge at the NAM are Jasper E. Crane, who is a DuPont executive, and J. Howard Pugh. Now, does that name sound familiar to you guys? Pugh? No. Pew doesn't mean anything to you. Pew, 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 pew. Yeah, well, I mean, there's that. You've never Obviously. heard of the, the Pew I, Research I, I, Center? I, 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 listen, like, listen, if you expect me to know that shit, you're way off No, base. you've heard of like the Pew Polls, the Pew right? Research. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, that that's that's who this is. Um, no shit! What did you think yeah. he came up with church benches? I legitimately 100% thought he came up with church benches. Okay. No, I know you think no. that's a joke. <laughs> Johnny Pugh. Joke. Everyone was just standing <laughs> for centuries where, before Johnny Pugh. Who else Pugh. would name them that? It had to be a guy named Pugh. <laughs> uh, no, Pugh is, the, Pugh is the namesake of the Pugh Research Center. He and his brother are. He and his brother are both rich business guys. Uh, and they start an organization called the Pugh Charitable Trust. Um, and in 19... 1996, the Pew Charitable Trust starts. So before the Pew Research Center is the Pew Research Center, it's owned by the Times Mirror Company and it's doing polling through there. And in 1996, the Pew Charitable Trust starts funding the Times Mirror Company's Research Center and it gets renamed the Pew Research Center. So that's where the name of the Pew Polling does. He does not found Pew Polling, but it is founded like in his name by the organization that he helped to found. So J. Howard Pew was the founder uh, of Sun Oil Company and one of the wealthiest men on the planet, Sunoco, right? Like that's that's mm. this dude, um, sure. and he has all of the money ever. Um, him in a Dupont, yeah. He, it was it's, it's literally him in a Dupont, right? Just like it sitting is around talking about how tough it is to the oligarchy, <laughs> yeah. oligarchy yeah, you can right, possibly all be rich. Oh, yeah. good times. Yeah. Definitely, these guys had strong opinions on yacht racing. Um, yeah. no, no questions. Uh, how so, are we going to fix the World Series this year? Yeah, that's what I'm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. So J. Howard Pugh dedicated a lot of his time earlier in his life to supporting the Republican Party. He backed a slew of anti-New Deal organizations with names like Sentinels of the Republic, the Crusaders, Ooh. and the Independent Coalition of American Women. Uh, when he founded his J. Howard Pugh Freedom Trust, he stated that its mission was to warn Americans about socialism, welfare statism, Marxism, fascism, and any other for like forms of government intervention, to acquaint the American people with the values of the free market, the dangers of inflation, the need for a stable monetary standard and again pew like all these other guys these are like america first types but then fascism you can't support fascism because a bunch half a million americans die fighting it so we no, fascism and marxism are the same yeah. same thing same ignore thing. the 20 million dead communists you know why why what are you gonna complain get yeah. out of here same thing um <laughs> Yeah, and obviously fascism uh, only ever gets to power with the buy-in of uh, the wealthy. But, you know, that's a story for another day and a story we told a couple of years ago. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a story for literally every story you tell. Yeah, that, that's just a story for forever. <laughs> that's just the story. So Pew's <laughs> first big attempt to culture jam his beliefs about capitalism into mainstream religion came through his work with a, an organization called the Layman's Council for the National Council of Churches. The NCC is like this big national church organization. Um, and his goal was not to put politics in the NCC. First, he just wanted to push them to not be political because he thought the clergy was so left wing that you could never never like turn them right so the best you can do is get them to not talk about politics and he eventually gave the ncc up as hopelessly liberal and when he reported back to his nam colleagues about the fact that like hey we're not going to get we're not going to get uh, these leftist ministers to stop talking about socialism his buddy jasper crane agrees that like the ncc is a lost cause now crane had made his millions in plastics and like pew he spent them backing a variety of far-right causes including a newspaper he called the free man 
He was heavily involved in Princeton's theological He's school. He's a slave. Yeah, <laughs> he's a slave to me. <laughs> yeah, um, the free man, yeah, yeah. And he kept up a bracing correspondence with different pastors. When Pew came to him complaining about the NCC, he wrote, quote, This nation, under God, was the slogan of the National Council of Churches when it was organized, and I have always felt that it was an incomplete quotation that has been improperly used in some quarters. What Lincoln said was, This nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom that has sounded magnificent, for liberty comes from God, and freedom, its environment, is maintained by the state. The United States of America, dedicated to freedom, affected the the separation of church and state, but that in no way threw over the doctrine that this nation is under God's governance. So you see why they want under God to be added to things, right? Because under God yeah. to them means God wants you to be free. Freedom is property. So by saying this nation is under God, we are saying this nation has to be dedicated to the preservation of property rights. That's mm. the argument he's making. It's like an entire speech is just like shut down to just like, I feel like you guys are incapable of critical thought. And they're all like, you are. We, yeah, totally. You are. Yeah, you're the smartest dude I've ever met. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, Oh, boy. And Dan, we are coming up to a quote you're going to like. So I think that might be the first time I've come across an idea that is now very normative in right wing circles that like separation of state doesn't mean this isn't a Christian country. Um, And to crane into pew Christianity and capitalism were hand in glove. They very much are in agreement with Fifield about this. And crane and pew exchange letters that we have. And in one of these letters, crane writes that the United States was presently mired at Quote, with ensuing bewilderment and terror, mounting crime, juvenile delinquency, sin, suffering and sorrow, as the different manifestations of socialism have spread across the world, communism, fascism, national socialism, interventionalism, Fabian socialism, the New Ooh. Deal, the welfare state, the danger becomes acute, Civil- civilization with liberty and human dignity seems doomed. List five more things. <laughs> yeah. I do love we got a Fabian socialism. Bones. You're all about <laughs> Fabian socialism, Dan. I'm all about it. I, I mean, I guess Alex yells about it a bit. <laughs> yeah. I learned about it from watching you and talking about Alex. <laughs> Did you sound like you're talking to like a uh, dad? Like, mm. uh, I, I'm doing these drugs. I learned watching I you. I learned about from it watching from you. watching you. Yeah. <laughs> so Pew and Crane, you know, this is a dark hour for them. They're they're they convinced civilization is doomed because they're the rich are being taxed uh and they could have been a great comedy duo in britain pew and uh, that would have been great yeah pew Mm -hmm. and crane i would watch the shit out of that throwing pies at the king in buckingham palace amazing pew crane and the fife (laughs) pew crane and the fife yeah Yeah. hey they call him dr pepper because he drinks a lot of soda that would have been a that would have been a better world um so (laughs) yeah they they decide after this thing with the ncc fails and they see like the propaganda that their buddies in the NAM coming up with just does not seem to be sticking the way they want it to. They decide to invest in Reverend Fifield. Um, now, Pew was well aware of Fifield's work, and while he while he admired the Christian libertarianism that Fifield uh, supported, he was really cynical about the hands-off approach that Fifield took to actually spreading his ideology. These, like, letters that he's sending ministers. Fifield mainly just, like, shotgunned essays and arguments out to ministers that he had on his mailing list, but he believed in leaving the details of what they should do up to the individual ministers. He didn't want to actually tell people what to do. And Pew wrote about this, quote, I am frank to confess that if Dr. Fifield has developed a con- concrete program and knows exactly where he is going and what he ac- expects to accomplish, that conception has never become clearly defined in my mind. So he's, he's kind of critical about this guy, but Pew is savvy enough to realize that NAM's propaganda has failed. One of his colleagues in the organization reported in 1945, quote, of the approximately 30 preachers with whom I have thus far talked, I have yet to find one who was unqualifiedly impla- impressed. One of the men put it most typically for the rest when he said, the careful preparation and framework for the meetings to which we are brought to is too apparent. We cannot help but see that it is expertly designed propaganda and that there must be big money behind it. We easily become suspicious. So like what mm. you're doing is obvious so all right all right bail on the ministers now we got to go for the kids okay (laughs) they're not smart enough to cut through our bullshit so let's convince that they're their children to support capitalism i I do like going after the kids yeah yeah that's the plan i also i also like the idea that there's that that realization of like this propaganda is too good. Yeah. <laughs> no one's going to fall for it. It's yeah. so obviously well funded. It, it, it's, it's really shamefully obvious. <laughs> oh my the, God. The this is Wendy's Twitter, Twitter account. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's one of these things, you know, 
what these guys are doing is very self-serving, obviously, and it's it's very cynical, and it's easy to believe that they're kind of like doing it um, cynically. Uh, but I, I don't, I think these guys are believers. I think they really believe what they are saying about Christianity and capitalism. I don't think they're doing this as sort of like a cold, uh, act of culture jamming. I think they are, they are trying to get their sincere beliefs out into the mainstream. Uh, that part- feels generous. Yeah. I, I, let, uh, let me, I'm going to read a letter to you that Crane wrote to Wilbur Leroux, a prominent Presbyterian in 1947 about spiritual mobilization, Fifield's group, because it gives you an insight into how Crane's thinking about things. They, spiritual mobilization, have simply stood for liberty of man as a son of God, created as a free being in the image of God. Now the insistence on liberty as a fundamental principle for mankind may be termed controversial because it is a revolutionary concept. So is Christianity. Liberty is being attacked and called lots of things which it is not by the fellow travelers, and even by many who lack understanding of the truth and indulge in idolatry of the state, a pagan philosophy." So that that's that's he's he's making like a pretty nuanced theological argument that liberty is property. Supporting property is a revolutionary concept because it means overthrowing the state. But you have to overthrow the state as a Christian because the state is a pagan philosophy. It is a it is an idol that's anti God. Like that's what this I think he believes what he's saying. Hmm. That is a question uh, of. I mean, people believed a lot of crazy shit. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't make it okay. People still believe a lot of crazy shit. It is the question of like, are these millionaires trying to like, uh, uh, like exploit capitalism? Are they doing it cynically, or are they doing it because that's what they believe about it? Is it is like a question of cynicism? Yeah, Yeah. I mean, I think it gets to the ultimate like stupid v evil continuum. You know, like yeah, of course you're stupid, but where on the evil continuum side are you if you're capable of like? analyzing how evil your own actions are yeah do you know what i'm saying yeah yeah and that is yeah that is the question um and obviously i don't i don't purport to have an absolute answer to that but i kind of feel like these guys were believers uh and i want to put it i don't know i feel like if you get a million dollars the only thing you believe in is million dollars you know what i'm saying well but you also you're gonna find ways to justify that if you're a dupont yeah well, yeah, that's yeah. kind of what I like. Your your core belief is I would like more than a million dollars. Yes, and then everything that spirals out from there. Yeah, but also if you're if the belief system you live in is Christianity, your core belief isn't just I want to have more money. Your core belief might be Jesus wants me to have more money. You know, mm. like wow, well, that's I, true. Yeah. That, it's it's a debatable point. Um, I, I'm going <laughs> to read a quote by Eckhart Toy writing for Pacific Northwest Quarterly again, kind of about. Is this is this Eckhart Tolle? No, no, Eckhart, Eckhart Toy. Okay, Just Eckhart Toy Junior. Actually, so okay. far, still an inspirational person. Mm-hmm. In 1947, Fifield and Spiritual Mobilization planned a program called Freedom in Peril. The plan was to send out the manuscripts of more than 15,000 copies of sermons on the subject of freedom. Ministers across the country were to preach them in October that year. All they had to sign was a return postcard indicating their willingness to preach on the subject of freedom. There were built-in incentives in the plan. If they preached one of the sermons on a specific date, ministers would be entered into a contest for substantial prizes. In a telegram dated October 13th, 1947, Fifield wrote to Crane that 25,000 pastors from a wide spectrum of denominations had preached his sermon on the perils to freedom as a part of spiritual mobilization's crusade. So now we have Fifield is taking their money and he has shifted his tactics. Now he is trying he is specifically trying to get people to do a thing. He's not just trying to convince them of something. He's saying, hey, I want you to write uh, I, I want you to write like a, a sermon. I've like or I, I've written a sermon. Um, I want you to um uh, I want you to give this to your your and your your. If you yeah. do, you'll be entered into a lottery. <laughs> and yeah, you can win money if you read this sermon. That's um, shady. And like, if you, you could write a sermon, if it's the best sermon on the subject of freedom, we could like, yeah, you could you could call it the shameless manipulation of faith for corrupt and venal ends. Um, mm-hmm. But Fifield also is a true believer. Um, we have, or at least I I think so. Uh, we have the correspondence these guys wrote out, um, and Fifield uh, feels like he's. 
he's being sincere in what he says. In 1948, he sent this letter to Crane about their next move. I am believing more and more that we will not win our fight for liberty by laying the principal emphasis on the material accomplishments of our American civilization. We must stress the spiritual and cultural accomplishments, the greater justice, and the increase in the solution of social problems. The results of voluntary co uh, corporation should be set forth as against the dire consequences of compulsion. The argument is clinched by the amazing material wealth, the aesthetic enjoyments, and the greater opportunity for the pursuit of happiness. I think following this line of thought, we are in a stronger position to combat the attack of the collectivists. Do you see what he's saying there? Uh, um, I think if everybody has a microwave, they'll be a lot happier. Yeah, if everyone has a microwave and then we <laughs> say, hey, you have that microwave because of uh christian libertarianism because exactly this, like and if you if you back if you if you were to get health care for example maybe we don't get microwaves anymore <laughs> and celebrating the possession of that microwave is godliness mm -hmm. is godliness in, in, in yeah, some form uh, yeah. let's let's remember jesus's parable of the uh servants and the talents you know mm -hmm. like uh a the master gave one servant one a talent microwave. and said bet it on this and you might win a microwave mm -hmm. and then everybody you know didn't win a microwave but that's what hope is that's what hope is that you might that's one day own is. a microwave you might win a microwave <laughs> so yeah by the late 1940s you can see all of the pieces for the what we've got going on now uh, in, on the christian right like you can see yeah. all of the pieces are there they haven't quite been put together yet but everything's in line and when we come back in part two we're going to talk about how fifield pew and the other plutocrats at nam struck back at the collectivists like this is now they've built this machine and it is raring to go but you know what else is raring to go uh before you get to that also uh, uh hoover mostly was pennsylvania yes. sorry i looked that up during <laughs> one of the breaks and i wanted to make sure People didn't tweet it at you. Okay, People, that's what it, that's did. that's what Hoover he won. won Pennsylvania. That was most God damn Pennsylvania. It. God <laughs> damn Don't it! Don't tweet at me. God it damn it! At knowledge <laughs> underscore fight. Don't tweet anything about Pennsylvania. God damn it! Yeah, yeah just fun. get out ahead of that. <laughs> Fucking Hoover. Wow. Uh, speaking of. Her Herbert Hoover, he's a big fan of your podcast, Knowledge Fight, which people can find at knowledgefight.com or wherever yeah. podcasts are in existence. So, yeah, it's some of those places. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. We're not on some things, though. We're not on a lot of things. No, that's true. Uh, wow. Like happiness. We're not uh, on Stitcher. Things. Stitcher, we're yeah. not on that. Yeah. <laughs> Im impersonate Dan and Jordan and download in, uh, all of their episodes and upload them on Stitcher. Do it. Yeah, you could do it. You <laughs> It'll do only it. take you eleven hundred hours. Yeah, I would it never take you years of your life. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, all right, Dan, Jordan. Any other plugs you wanna you wanna throw out? No, I think we're good. I mean, nah. you got a novel, Jordan. Oh, I do. Yeah, but that true. was that was a while back. People have been uninterested <laughs> okay. in that. <laughs> I I mean, you know, I'm working on another one. I'll tell people about that when it's done. All right, all right. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us here at Behind the Bastards. Um, until Thursday when we'll come back and I'll make you guys sadder than you are right now. Yay! Yay!